are the youth the hope of the future? Are you? I think and I believe you are. You are already the hope of the present. Even more, I believe you are the future of hope itself. To invoke Martin Luther King, if the future is now, there is a first urgency of that now. Because what we do now affects both the present and the future. And that future is now. What we call the future generation is among us now. And the problems we are confronted with in our world today are affecting them, in fact, all of us. This summer, at the start of June, I have had the pleasure of hosting young people from different parts of France. They trained with me under the program of Inspire Change Corporate under the leadership of Marie Charlotte Stur. Their training centered around the United Nations and how this multilateral body is addressing the issues dear and near to the concerns of young people. They attended as many events at the UN and surrounding venues as their NGO buds allowed them. It is my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, friends, to present in this panel to these young people whose youth belie the professional training and expertise they already bring to the table. So I ask them a very simple question, one particular question with two parts. Tell me what your fears today are, then tell me also your hopes for the future. If we are to recognize that our young people are claiming their future, then that future is now. Any conception of future generations must contend with the young people's expressed desire to be primary stakeholders of their future and that they must have a seat at tables where their future is at stake, be it at the meal tables with family and friends, at peace tables negotiating conflicts and tensions, or at decision-making tables and multilateral bodies like the United Nations. I am fortunate to have a group of young professionals, all under 30, who have worked with me while doing their research in New York. I have been blessed by their presence, but even more, by sharing who they are and what they do and what the future augurs for them because they are acting upon that future. So on with the discussions. <laughs> Alia. Well, Levi, I would say my worst fear is both very intimate and very political. It is related to the fact that I was born and that I identify as a woman in a world where gender equality is still far from being achieved. My gender is not something I can act on to change. It is who I am. And like many women, I am deeply aware of all the way it can make me discriminated against in a patriarchal society. In the professional area, indeed, women have fewer opportunities to access leadership positions. When they do, their salary remains globally lower than the ones of their male colleagues with equivalent responsibilities. In the family structure, women dedicate more time than their male partner to housekeeping, administrative, planning, and educative tasks, while being more at risk of suffering from domestic abuse. Even the everyday act of walking in the street is not sourced as act for my gender. From common street harassment to assault, the public space is hardly ever totally safe for women. There have been significant improvements in gender equality over the year. Compared to my grandmother, I was born with the right to vote, to have my own bank account, and to have bodily autonomy over issues such as contraception or abortion. However, Recent significant regression make me fear that my young nieces might not grow up with the same rights. We see the abortion right being drastically curtailed in Poland or in the United States, for example. That being said, I am well aware that those considerations focus on Western societies. Even if the situation of European and American women leave much to be desired, it remains very privileged compared to those of women in other countries. What's more, even in those countries, women have significant differences according to their skin color, sexual orientation, social background, or disability. Discrimination are interlinked and systemic and should be fought against as such. What about you, Jessica? What do you think? Yes, I think gender equality is also a subject that I have question about, especially regarding the private sector. Women and men remain inequally represented in a large number of sectors and industries and their, their salaries remain unequal for the same positions. 
data from INSEE, the French National Institute for Statistics and Economic Studies, showed that the wage gap between women and men was around 4% for comparable working hours and position in 2021. Also, people with disabilities remain underrepresented in companies. Although the 1980 French law for the employment of disabled people imposes a quota of 6% of disabled employees, the private sector is struggling to reach 3.9%. One of my fears also concerns the integration of refugees. Even today, we don't know how to enable men, women and children who have lost everything in their country of origin to rebuild their lives by facilitating facilitating access to refugee status and appropriate career path. As the number of refugees has increased due to the climate crisis, we urgently need to find human solutions to promote their inclusion. Predominant in our societies, all these divisions through inequality and perpetuate the destructive model of capitalism and paternalism. I'm afraid that we're still moving too slowly in including people in need in society through work, exacerbating the existing social fractures. What about you, Leah? Thank you, Jessica. Personally, my worst fear is related to the unfair treatment that minorities and people of color face in their daily lives. Being a part of a racial minority in the country I live in, I experienced very early as a young person different forms of discrimination and racism. My parents are from Algeria, but I was born and raised in France. My identity as an Arab woman is not something that I could or would change. It is one of the components that made me who I am today. But I also know that for the same reason I will face as other person of colors, more difficulty in every aspect of my life. Indeed, internalized racism is deeply rooted in Western society due to previous colonization. We started from the very beginning with a disadvantage, uh, not within our control. Racial minorities and people of color are penalized in all aspects of, of society, from professional to uh, housing opportunity, as well as their constant concern for safety in public space, which is more related to racism and xenophobia. All these differentiated and uneven treatment lead to tension and conflicts, as uh, Victoria will say and talk about, uh, and have no communication, which leads to extreme causing greater polarization. The murder in France of a young Arab boy two months ago by a policeman emphasized my constant insecurity and questioned myself of how far will this unequal treatment will go or continue and for how long will minorities have to live with these insecurities <coughs> and death and these fears. It's a good question at the end, uh, Leah. So let's see how Victoria handles and proceeds uh, from that question. Um, personally, my biggest fear is division, which leads to conflicts. We have noticed for several years that people and population that tend to be divided also tend to enter into more conflicts. Everything becomes more violent and disagreements turn into violence. There are different factors why there are so public affairs and policies for sure, but also let's not forget about social media that have a si significant role. As Leah explained before, racial discrimination and also gender discrimination indeniably lead to conflicts, including internal conflicts like those happening in France for several years now, and even more recently, but also armed conflicts in different areas of the world, such as Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. There are fractures within the same state, even more than international fractures between states. The United States is divided between conservatives and Democrats, leading to internal violence, including ideological divisions and culture wars jeopardizing women's rights. France is divided over immigration policy and labor regulations leading to police violence too. Moreover, the fight against terrorism is a real international matter too. Geneva law about armed conflict is lacking and does not include asymmetrical conflicts, like conflicts between an organized group and a state, which is also about terrorism. There are new areas and new subjects that need to be regulated with binding normative instruments. Another reason for that is environmental issues and ecological problems, such as the lack of resources that are only getting worse. 
as states realize short ages in water and food resources, competition to find such resources heightens, potentially leading to conflict, and when violence becomes the rule, armed conflicts will arise. Thank you, Victoria. Actually, what you said raised uh, an important problem, like conflict raised uh, is a point important for me. Uh, it, it resonates with my personal fear, which is our inaction regarding environmental des destruction. Because we can only resolve conflicts and wars if we address the most important issue of the century, which is the destruction of the environment. This destruction and the destruction of the resources will reinforce existing inequalities as mentioned by the other panelists as Leah or Elia um, and create also new ones. The lack of water, the destruction of ocean biodiversity, the global warming, the disappearance of species, it will create new global conflicts and it will, um, that will remain unsolvable unless we find a way to manage our resources appropriately and protect our planet efficiently. So my greatest fear is that we will reach a point, a stage of destruction of nature that will prevent us from turning back. Despite all the warnings from scientists and all the great speeches on the subject, the actions taken remain insufficient. So nature is resilient, but only up to a point. There's too many planetary limits that have been already exceeded and we should act accordingly. We need to protect nature at the very least because it is useful to us and because we need it. And personally, my concern are even bigger for the ocean. As a surfer and a diver, the ocean is central to my personal life. We don't know much about these immense spaces and yet we are already destroying it. We should do something about it. And as Sylvia Earle said during the World Ocean Day at the United Nations in the beginning of June, the most important thing we take from the ocean isn't the fish or the krill, it's our own life. Because the more we take from the ocean, the more we take from our life. So it is in our interest to survive. If we want to survive, we need to protect the environment because it is a selfish move to do if we want to live and I just want to end up with something I'm not saying that there is no will there is a will like we want to do something and this will enable us to make advances that cannot be denied but this is not enough and more is needed because there are blockages at other levels than the willingness I'm so pleased about the movement of fears from social and personal relations into global planetary concerns. And I think, Chloe, you, you proceed to develop further the idea of environmental destruction. Yeah, thank you, Levi, of course. Uh, my biggest fear today is the slowness of ambitious environmental decision. We can see that the problem is not the lack of will, but the way that will is implemented and the divergence in achieving our common goal. While solution for climate change consequences must be global, the stumbling blocks in international agreements illustrate the limits of multilateralism in the face of emergency. Here are a few examples. At the time of Copenhagen and Canton agreements, Pablo Solon, former of Bolivian ambassador of the United Nations, criticized the approach based on voluntary contribution by states to reduce the harmful effects of environmental degradation. I quote, Imagine you want to build a dam to protect a village from flooding. Everyone brings the stone they want to the dam. Some bring more because they have a greater sense of responsibility, but a certain height is needed to hold back the flood. Then you realize that the dam isn't big enough to protect you. And another note, the head of Australian government was criticized in 2021 for announcing that is in country that his country would achieve carbon neutrality as soon as possible and preferably by uh, 20, 2050 but without making any commitments in that direction in the same period the temporary withdrawal of the united states from the paris agreement raised concern about his commitment to international financing against the adverse effects of climate change in the country of south pascal campin a former of the European Parliament for Europe Ecology, also pointed out that the climate faces many objections in the name of social justice. In France, we are told that it's unthinkable to increase the price of fuels because of the fuel poverty, 
because of suburban households are forced to have two cars, whatever the country. We will encounter this kind of blockage unless we implement public policy that articulate justice and transition. Similarly, in 2013, neonicotinoids, insecticides harmful to bees and a pollinator, raised concern about biodiversity and food safety. In response to this concern, the European Union considered banning certain neonicotinoids. However, under pressure from the chemical industry and certain agricultural groups who argued that these pesticides were essential to protect crops from pests and ensure high agricultural yields, the European Court of Justice ruled that these insecticides would be definitely banned only from 2021. It took eight years for these two directives to come into effect. And that brings me here, today. We live in the hope that individual and collective interests can converge in the name of a common global goal. Reality shows us that measure to protect sustainable development in one region is not exempt from injustice elsewhere. We know that governments, but also private actors, will not allow themselves to be harmed by standards policy that is detrimental to them, although better for the planet. It's necessary to change the institution decision-making process, particularly lobbying role in rulemaking to achieve a fast and equitable transition. We know that multilateralism has enabled much progress, but we cannot be satisfied with decades of progress with the awareness that more is needed. We can't maintain the excess of our system. That's an interesting statement you made. We cannot maintain the excesses of our system. Ah. The plot gets thicker. <laughs> Let's hear from Alice. Yes, uh, my main fear concerns the way we try to solve the ecological crisis. I think we are entirely missing the points. Um, the first thing is that in our society, biodiversity loss is still overshadowed by economic stakes, whereas it's the supreme threat. So we won't achieve any SDGs in a world where nature collapses. So protecting nature must be a priority and not a secondary issue. Uh, secondly, I think we tackle ecological issues independently of each other, but trying to solve problems one by one makes the situation worse. So for example, electric cars are presented as a solution to the climate crisis but their manufacture causes enormous mining pollution and thus it exacerbates biodiversity loss. So it's time to adopt a systemic vision because ecological problems are complex and interact. And it's also time to admit that the only way to reduce our impacts on nature is through the degrowth paradigm, not green growth. And finally, I'd like to talk about how we protect nature uh, for decades, the solutions promoted by our governments and by the UN have generally been technological, scientific, and financial. More innovation, more data, more money, and despite all these efforts, we're still failing to protect nature. But this is normal. I mean, we're not tackling the roots of the problem here. We focus on pollution, climate change, biodiversity collapse, but these are only the symptoms of a much deeper illness, humans. Um, so it's not really nature that needs to be protected, it's us, our civilization, that needs fundamental change. Planting trees or saving some species will only be useful if we totally shift our mindset. There's no point actually in protecting nature as long as we perceive it as an object to be exploited and as long as nature is reduced to its instrumental or worse economic value. Because yes, today uh, at the UN, for instance, we talk about natural capital, ecosystem services, and green economy. So nature is becoming an object offering various services that can be marketed and then financialized. But we don't protect nature here. We absorb it into our capitalist system. And this mindset reflects precisely what we need to stop an anthropocentric Western visions of nature domination. So I think that if we don't manage to achieve environment-related SDGs, it's because we lack, first and foremost, an ecological consciousness. More than data, technologies, or innovations, it's our moral stance that we need to shift above all. 
And for this, we need to reconnect deeply with nature, not with technology, but with our hearts. So yes, my greatest fear today is that we'll continue our made race for growth, technology and innovation without questioning ourselves, thinking that this paradigm can save the living world when in reality it keeps destroying it. You raised about the moral perspective and it's important because budgets are moral documents. When you raised financialization, all that governments and even private sector would do, there's just not enough money. There's enough money for war, but there's not enough money for improving our planetary life. So financialization is a moral question. And as long as we don't fund the things that make people and the planet sustainable and secure, as a moral bankruptcy. So thank you very much. Cyprian, yeah. how do we pursue further the conversation that we have heard? I mean, I really enjoyed the discussion so far and I think we raised very interesting points. But I think my main concern and my fear here is that we, educated and wealthy enough people to have time to discuss that, we are gathering today in this meeting room just like some other brilliant people did yesterday and the day before and maybe so on and so forth for, for decades actually. And they gathered and they talked about similar concerns and with similar evidence out there in the world. And I feel like we know that our living standards are far beyond our planet's bearable capacity, like Alice mentioned. And this is not new. I mean, the UN, 75 years ago, they've been created like we are not even born. The IPCC, it was 30 years ago. The limits to growth, that was 50 years ago. So all the evidence are out there and all this intention, all trying to heal our sick civilization, but yet inequalities among and within countries keep on rising. And yet our ecological footprint has never been more significant than now. And so what? When will we accept that we need to change? Actually, we need to transform our paradigm. It's not about minor adjustment or technical fix. And just like Alice mentioned, it's about transforming and inventing a new paradigm where we could think differently. It's about our political and economic structures. It's about our social interactions, the way we move, the way we eat, the way we consume. We need to forget the old world, ditch it, and look beyond our tra traditional lenses. And as long as privileged people like us here today in this room um, continue discussing in such like nice rooms air co with air conditioning, but really out of touch with the harsh reality, I feel like nothing will change. And as long as we seek to develop and grow our extractivist and unsustainable economic activities, nothing will change. And the worst in that, in my opinion, is that this so-called game of development and progress played by most of the wealthy nations does not make even people happier or better off because what we observe is that once the basic needs are covered, making uh, economic growth, it doesn't increase happiness. So I am scared. I'm scared that we will pursue the same deadly path, ruining the planet and not making humanity better off. And obviously I'm saying this as a privileged person, um, but I think that we all are here. I fear and I'm scared, I'm truly scared that we continue to go blindly in the same direction when we need a radical transformation, a radical shift of our paradigm. I am scared that we will still be here in this room 30 years from now discussing the same concerns with even worse evidence. Paradigmatic shifts. I'm so glad to hear it uh, from you because I think after hearing already so many and more is about to come, what you're calling for is not just paradigmatic shift but a tech tonic awakening yes. <laughs> of the consciousness of people. Yeah. So it's not just a changing of the scientific knowledge, but a changing of a mindset, yes. a combination of the two. Let's go back to something much more personal. Fear to have children. <laughs> Let's go on. Yeah, thank Relax. you, Levi. And thank you to everyone who made really great points today. Uh, that's amazing. I'm uh, really grateful uh, to have uh, to be here today. So uh, my current fear is that our children will have to live in an insecure world and moreover a world suffering from climate change. 
I don't want to have any tr children so long as the state will not take drastic measures to assure some security and stability for them. And I think that many people old enough to ask themselves if they want children are asking themselves a question. And it's an issue if there's no future generations, obviously. We should leave a sustainable world for them so they can pursue previous generations work or else there is no hope. Thank you, Leanne. The mantra at the UN for sustainable development is for people and the planet. With your presentation, we come full circle. We started with people concerns to the planetary concerns and then we go back to children. That nothing that we do, if it were not for the protection of children today and them being the future generation, will redound to nothing because unless we protect the children now, the future is compromised. Yes. Are you ready to talk about the sources of your hopes and what those are? Yeah. So, so many fears, they're valid and warranted. And ladies and gentlemen, you've been warned about those fears, but be excited with me to hear about their hopes. I do share this concern about the world that will be left for our children, but I also think that the younger generation can be a source of hope. We're witnessing a new generation that no longer hesitates to take its place in the public debate and act on its own initiative. It's a more informed and politically aware generation. Numerous bottom-up initiatives are shaking up established institutions, and personalities are leading on those issues, like Greta Thunberg Dick for the Friday for Future. It is facilitated by an ultra-connected world, and it's not without its problem, but it allows social movement to grow and coordinate horizontally without being framed by institutions. Is it the same thing for the private sector, Jessica? Yeah, I think the, the private sector really can be a real driving force of the integration of disabled people, as well as refugees, and a promoter of gender equality in the workplace. I think one of the best ways to help reduce inequality and promote inclusion is to implement a CSR strategy in all of the companies. However, to be effective, um, this strategy must be applied in all of the company, in all the decision, and all of the employees must be involved. And it can be uh, hard to make it happening than it seems. For the past two years, I've been working as head of the CSR strategy of Up and Charge, which is a French startup selling a wireless charging system for electrical vehicles. And what I've come to realize is that as a startup, it's particularly difficult to establish a foothold in a market and to surround yourself with partner partners who all share the same social and environmental ambitions. One must make concessions in the beginning to exist, and then once established, you can afford to make choices that are more costly for the company, but more ethical. So there is hope that one day it will be the opposite, to establish a company that will have to show, previous to anything else, its commitment to the security and to the sustainability of people and of the planet. The United Nations Global Compact, which aims to get businesses and firms worldwide to adopt sustainable and socially responsible policies and to report on their implementation, today includes more than 9,500 companies in over uh, 160 countries. So maybe one day, every company in the world will sign this pact and will work together for a better world. I hope. And these companies are signing up for the best labor practices, for the best implementation yeah. of human rights for all. So yes. thank you for, for raising that. Let, let's see the key role of the international community and international cooperation. We, and we start off with Victoria, where that hope lies. So it's interesting because we all have very different hopes, but as a real believer in justice and law, I really think that the hope lies in the need for regulation and international cooperation. And this is impossible without a tight knit international community, including a vigilant civil society. 
The UN has done unbelievable work to create the International Criminal Court and also all of the international criminal tribunals such as for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia and we need to pursue the same goal for Ukraine and other concerned states. I'm personally doing my research analysis on the crime of genocide and Afghanistan issues and for an example I really think that we should consider including a gender consideration into the crime of genocide definition of the Rome Statute. That's just one example. I think that we really need this international law and cooperation. However, we must update those institutions and instruments to the actual configuration of both lingering and newly involving conflicts. The second issue is reconciliation between the people and people themselves within states and between states. I sincerely believe in transitional justice and reconciliation. If not, anger will remain and conflicts will continue to flare. It's interesting to note that you mentioned the International Criminal Court in the same speech that you talk about vigilant civil society. If not for civil society, the International Criminal Court would not have been established. Mm -hmm. And I was glad I was there. I was previously discussing with you. So thank you very much for that. Chloe, where do we go from there? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Livy, and thank you, Victoria, for your intervention. So concerning my hopes regarding institutions, we know that certain institutions have already made faster decisions, in some cases, mostly important ones. For example, the European Commission presented its legislative proposal for a ban on single-use plastic in May 2018. In the European Parliament, approved the proposal in March 2019. So after negotiations, provisional agreement was switched between EU institutions in December 2019 and the directive was formally adopted in January 2020. It came into force on, on 2021. The speed of this adoption reflects the recognition of the urgency of plastic pollution in the ocean and the political will to act quickly. I'm hopeful that these institutions are evolving and adapting measures to be resilient to climate change consequences. I don't know if I discussed this with you, the difference between political will and political courage. This is one particular contribution to the conversation. There's political will by people to sustain the planet. What is lacking is political courage by politicians mm -hmm. to listen to the voice of the people. Mm -hmm. That's basically what democracy is. Political will resides in and among the people. What politicians need to exhibit is courage and wisdom to act on the, what the people are saying. You're not wrong. I'm simply saying that we need to pair political will with political courage and political wisdom. Courage and wisdom are lacking among our politicians. And we need, to, we need the people to give it even a bigger push. Alice is back <laughs> on this um, paradigm. Thank you, Livy. Um, my hope is rekindled when I notice that more and more people around the world are seeking to break free from this Western liberal vision. We, the young generations, want more and more to deconstruct these obsolete narratives and envisage new relationships with nature for a regenerative world. So more and more of us feel the need, the vital desire to reconnect deeply with the living world. Uh, it means that we want to feel that we belong to nature, not that nature belongs to us. Um, and this is this elevation of consciousness that is a sign for me of a radical paradigm shift. Um, and it's a promising change that can guarantee both planetary health and the well-being of future generations. I like the idea of narratives. And what excites me about our conversation around this table is that you're challenging received notions and therefore you are re-narrativizing re this received notion. And I think the jaded ones of the UN, the, even the jaded leaders of civil society need to listen to the plea for re-narrativization. Yep. Yeah, my hopes and fears I think resonate quite a lot with Alice's ones. And um, I would say, especially my hopes nowadays, 
come a lot from the people on the field. Uh, actually, those people who decided to fight and stand for a different life and world, using head, heart and hands to make the change happen. These are the people who are aware that our ecological system and institutions of governance may eventually fail or even collapse. But still, they're fighting because there is a meaning in this international and intergenerational struggle for human dignity and for human rights, and for peace and security and for solidarity and sustainability. They show that positive and alternative futures linked with the narrative that you mentioned are possible, where people can thrive aside from the madness of our unsustainable world and of our unsustainable production and consumption patterns. When I see this, I have hope because achieving them is possible. <coughs> the ideas you propounded are not outrageous, but it make, drives me positively mad. Is that what you meant by madness here? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and so is mad. thank you very much for in such a short while, in such a few minutes, you were able to traverse the entirety of the burden of the entire webinar, which is to look at gender justice, to look at youth concerns from an inter and intragenerational perspective, the solidarity that I think will be generated by the conversation with the young people in the audience hearing the conversation, I can already feel is enormous. Now, you did not necessarily address the documents on our common agenda, Summit of the Future, but I hope that the United Nations officials and the governments participating in this webinar intently listened to the re-narrativization of the agenda before the UN, because they strike deeply into the common agenda of the Secretary General. It strikes deeply into the vision of the Secretary General for a youth envoy to permeate the governance structures uh, of, of the United Nations and for a summit of the future to not only deal with the historic inequalities of the past, but an insurance of the human rights of those yet to be born and those who are already acting upon the issues of the world, like these young professionals that I presented before you. Thank you very much okay. for the freshness of ideas. Go and pursue those ideas and make them happen. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.